Welcome. It's very really nice to see you all here. It's, uh, we are very happy to see this uh, such a good turnout. Um, so uh, this talk will handle, uh, will, uh, will discuss paradoxes, principles, and architectures of software modularity. Uh, my name is Andrzej Olszak. Until very recently, I have been a, a PhD research fellow at the University of Southern Denmark. There I was investigating the, topic, the very topic of software modularity. And th this talk, by the way, is a result of doing this. Um, then I'm also a creator of the Futurist tool that, uh, that, that is also connected with modularity. I will talk about the tool a little bit more in the slides. Uh, right now I, I fight cancer. I work at a Danish company called DACO that does cancer diagnostics. Um, with me is Jaroslav Tulach. He is, as you probably all know, he is uh, the founder and the architect of the NetBeans ID and the NetBeans Rich Cloud platform. He's an experienced API designer and renowned speaker and author of several books on, on API design. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the talk basically is divided into, into two parts. First, I will talk about how you split up your legacy or your monolithic application into modules, so how you design the boundaries. Uh, in this, I will d discuss different, how, how to split up different architectures, what principles you can use to guide this process. Then there will be Jaroslav uh, telling about uh, how to design the co interconnections between the modules, so the APIs of the modules, and then he will use some paradoxes and principles to illustrate this. Okay, so basically the grand motivation of this talk is that at some point, uh, if you haven't done that already, you will have to get out of the monolithic cave. Basically, you, you, you have probably heard about all this project Jigsaw and all this uh, modularization effort that, that is going on. So if it will not be because of the developers that will, will, will want to switch, then at some point there will also be the management at probably at your company saying, oh, there's this new thing, you know, was cloud two years ago, now we have this modularity thing, we have to go for it. <laughs> so uh, it's good to be ready. Um, but uh, really, um, so if we just look at what is, uh, what is a monolithic system. So a monolithic system, that's also where the cave metaphor comes in. So if you look at this, this beautiful picture here, it's a little bit like a monolithic system. So there's no logical disconnected part that you can distinguish. In a, this, of course, uh, also applies to software. So this is just a metaphor of a, of a software system. So there's, uh, in a monolithic system, there's no logical parts that you can distinguish. If you want to change a part of the system, then it's very likely that the change will affect pretty much everything else in the system. In such, a, such systems are difficult to evolve, and, and it's difficult to control complexity if, in such systems. So where we would like to go, we'd like to go, we would like to achieve, we'd like to create a, a modular system out of our monolithic system, because the modularity traditionally promises that if you, de uh, if you correctly decompose your system into, into logical modules, then you will be able to partially comprehend, so partially understand the system, and also par partially change it. So basically this promises that um, a modular system, in a modular system you will be able to look at one module in isolation from the rest and understand it kind of by itself, and when you change it, hopefully then the, the changes should not propagate too much to other modules. And then the tool that you, <coughs> that you would like to use uh, to do that is, is a module system. So module system is a tool and uh, basically what a module system does, probably most of you know already what a module system is, but I, I, I just mentioned that. Um, uh, what a module system does is it allows you to physically separate your logical modules. So basically you are getting something a little bit like advanced jar files where you can actually declare the version number and explicit dependencies and explicit exports from your modules. Uh, so this, 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 all this enforces uh, improved uh, uh, code isolation. However, since a module system is as, as only a tool, it's possible to misuse it. So basically the, the core here is that uh, just having or just using a module system does not imply that you will end up with modular source code. It's how you use it. So it's how you design the division into the modules and how you design the in interconnections between them. So that, that's really the motivation of this talk. We will look into how to design those divisions and those APIs in, in a beneficial way. So we'll start with architectures. 
So I will use uh, a running example here for this part. Uh, that that will be we will just assume that uh, there's a simple system that we want to modularize. It has some it, it has three layers. Uh, first is UI, then there's some kind of a logic layer that uh, uh, encapsulates uh, some algorithms, and then there's some domain model layer could be also persistence underneath. Um, this system, let's assume that it provides three features to the users. It, as you could see by the by the ovals on the picture, um, each of the features has some UI. That's the kind of uh, usually what happens. Every feature has to have some UI in order to take parameters and show the results of, of the run. <laughs> then it has some logic and, uh, and also has some domain models, uh, parts of the domain model that, that are used in that feature. Why, why, why do I think uh, this, uh, this example is particularly good? Because it actually kind of is the boiled down, it's the essence of several architectures that you may know. If you, for example, look at model view controller, model view presenter, onion architecture, hexagonal architecture, and some, some more architectures, then basically what they boil down to is this kind of vertical layering of technical concerns. So technical concerns such as UI, logic, domain model, <coughs> persistence. Okay, so let's say that we want to modularize this system, this, this very popular archi architecture. So we have at least, oh, at least three options. So the first option is, okay, let's just take the packages, let's just, let's just take the layers that we had and, and, close, that, and close them in one big uh, module. That's not much of, of modularization, but st still, we are using module system, right? So we, we are allowed to do that in principle. Okay, the second way we can do it is we simply say, okay, let's take the packages as we have them now and let's try to just wrap them with modules. Then basically you also get a kind of a layered set of modules that mimics the, the original structure of your application. The third way to do it, so we have looked at the horizontal division, so the third way to do it a different way has to be a vertical division, and indeed it is. So um, the vertical division would be to say, okay, we have to split up the original uh, structure of the program and, and make uh, each module encapsulate one feature of the program. Then we, we end up with three features. So we have those, let's say we have those three options. So how do, we, how do we choose what is the best way of modularizing this kind of architecture? Yeah, it's actually a difficult question. There's no straight, uh, simple answer to that, as we'll see in a moment, because uh, modularity is not uh, modularity is, is a relative property of software. So it's, software is always modular with respect to something. So then, then the something is the changes that you actually want to prepare your software for. Um, this, as you can see, there's a small reference I, I give there. I will be doing that throughout the slides and at the end there will be a list of those references then you can look up uh, and maybe read up on, on those topics in some papers. If you are interested then the slides will be online. Then you, you can uh, find that later on. Um, so as it was discussed by Parnas long time ago actually, uh, then the modularity actually depends on the changes that, uh, the soft, uh, that you, your software has to accommodate in the future. Okay, let's, uh, and yeah, I'll just use a simple example to demonstrate that. I will have two change scenarios. The first one will be, okay, we want to modify a user functionality. Maybe if it's a, a text editor, then we want to modify how the spell checking is done, or whatever. Then let's see how the first architecture accommodates this change, the first division into modules. In this scenario, you, uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, the change will affect all three layers of the application. Basically, this, this is a little bit problem problematic. Why? I'll, I'll just tell you in a moment. Um, as you can see here, I, I drawn those arrows just to say that uh, whenever you change part of a module, then since there is no boundary, boundary between what you are changing and what should not be changed, for example, in the view layer, then it's very easy for changes to, to propagate since there is no kind of insulation to, to isolate the changes. Uh, another thing that is, uh, is very problematic is not only the changes uh, dislocated uh, or de delocalized over the three modules, but also the scope of change is actually divided itself. So basically the, the boundaries of modules come in your way. So 
let's imagine that uh, first you, you are looking in the GUI of your program. Okay, you know which GUI elements uh, uh, implement uh, the, the feature that, that you are changing. Then in order to track it down to bottom layer, you actually have to hop over the, the boundaries of the module. And actually, this, this kind of decision, Yaroswap will talk a little bit more about that later, but this, this kind of stuff is, is quite problematic. So in contrast, if we look at the second architecture, this change is very well accommodated. It just perfectly corresponds to one of the modules. Brilliant. Very nice. Um, so if we just look at a different change scenario, <coughs> which could be kind of interesting to some people, um, migrating your, your UI to JavaFX. That's kind of a different, different kind of change. As you can see, the first division into modules, that's, that's really perfect. Then you just take the old view, throw it away, re-implement, uh, make, make the new one, and pretty much the controller and the model layers will not be affected. So that's a very nice scenario. However, if you look on the second uh, division into modules that we, that we have, this change becomes a little bit problematic. Then we run into exactly the same problems as I discussed later for the, for the first division with the first scenario. So the change is delocalized and the, it's, it's easy for the changes to propagate to the code that should in principle not be affected. So basically there is no silver bullet modularization. You always have to look at the changes that, you, that, that will happen in the future. But of course, how do we, how do we look, look into the future? That's a little bit difficult. Um, one thing we can do, we can, if, we, if, if you have experienced programmers or experienced domain experts, maybe they will actually anticipate some of the things that may happen. Maybe you have worked on, sim on similar projects to, wo to what you are doing now, so then you can reuse that knowledge. There's also some other uh, sources of, of data about that. Um, there are several papers uh, that uh, report on the software co costs in organizations. What is commonly reported in those papers is that uh, during the evolution period of software, it's the users that drive the changes. So uh, 75, around 75% of changes during the evolution and maintenance of software is connected with enhancing, adding, or fixing uh, features, functional features for the users. The remaining 25 is, uh, is the rest, is, is other kinds of changes. Just to give you a kind of a more yeah, more overall impression about uh, the importance of this thing. Uh, I, I include this part. So from this other uh, green pie chart, you can see that uh, that's the, the phase of software evolution and maintenance typically, typically consumes from 60 to 90 percent of, uh, uh, of costs in organizations. And that, that really sharply, uh, sharply contrasts with the 10 to 40 percent of the initial development. So, so preparing for evolution, that's a really, uh, that's a really important point. And so basically conclusion from this picture is that, uh, that uh, out of the two divisions that we have seen, out of the two change scenarios that we have considered, the one connected with user functionality, that's, that, that, that will tend to happen more often. So, we have this kind of understanding, we have this kind of mental framework, but does it work? Uh, we have actually tried that in, in practice, this kind of an idea. There was an uh, application called NDVs that is developed by a company called Visitrend. Uh, basically the tool is um, a tool for neurological analysis, it's kind of a complicated domain. Um, so, so basically the story behind that was that the, uh, the company uh, wanted to modularize this, uh, this piece of software. They, they were also kind of undergoing the NetBeans training and NetBeans Rich Client Platform and NetBeans module system. Then we actually got connected to them uh, through Gertian from the NetBeans team. So that was, that was really nice because he heard, oh, you need to modularize this piece of software. Oh, I know, the guy that, I know a guy that, that is interested in modularity. He has this tool. Let's see if it works. You know, we can try it out. So that, that was really cool. Uh, so so the, the idea was the company wanted to bring the, the NDVs uh, application from, from a monolithic state to port it to the NetBeans module system and then gradually scale up to, the, to embrace the whole NetBeans rich client platform. Um, the motivation for, the, for modularizing the code base was to improve the functional customizability of the, of the program. 
so that it becomes easier to take features in and out of the of the program and to evolve features independently for, from one another. Um, another point that was uh, that was very important for the owners of the of the project was to improve the reusability of the core algorithms of the of the software because then they had a larger portfolio of applications that they were developing so they wanted to reuse some of the parts that that was not really possible with the monolithic approach so they needed to modularize so the starting point was that the the application was actually quite small as you can see it was only 10000 uh, line of code uh, lines of code and uh, 27 use cases. So that's that's kind of small. It's it's not not so small to be considered a toy example, but it's certainly not a, a very big system. However, what made uh, the the whole thing, the whole transition, quite quite problematic was that the code base was uh, was unfamiliar to us when we started, and the the domain uh, to this day I don't know how. <laughs> what really happens in the, this uh, neurological analysis thing? I don't, you know, the tool consists of a, like a visualization of neurological data. I don't really know how it works. But this didn't prevent us from modularizing the software. So basically, uh, we had this tool uh, that is called Futurus. Then we we basically used that to to modularize NDVs. How we did that was well, there were several steps of doing this. Uh, the tool is uh, is a plugin to the NetBeans IDE. So it builds up on the on the on the libraries and and has integrations with code editor and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and you can also find it online and also find the sources. You can play out, play around with it. Um, so so basically, how how the process worked was uh, first we actually needed to uncover where in order to modularize features of NDVs we needed to uncover or find where actually they are implemented. So we needed to find the, the packages, methods, the classes that implement each of the features. So that we can actually kind of uh, understand how, how they work and how they relate to one another. So if this will be difficult to split them, uh, so we did that through so-called feature location. That's basically a fancy name for establishing traceability links between features and source code. So basically finding where the features are implemented. In Futurus, uh, this is done through dynamic analysis. So we trace uh, the execution when, uh, of a program when, when the user interacts with uh, with a program. Then we Basically, this way we are able to to tell which which methods gets executed. Uh, based on this traceability information, uh, Futurus provides a number of feature-oriented views. So basically, there are some visualizations on top of the traceability links, like there's some different plots and graphs. So you can use that to understand how features relate to each other, how they are implemented in terms of packages or classes. Uh, then. Based on this kind of understanding, uh, we performed an iterative modularization of features. So we'll take in some features each day and, and modularizing them. Uh, a good help in doing that was, uh, was this kind of uh, tight integration with the NetBeans ID. So for, for example, one of the things was that uh, while programming, we were able to see those colored sidebars next to the code that saying, OK, this, this method is actually implemented by is is contributing to this feature and that feature. So then that that was very easy. That was that was really helping a lot. Then the last step was establishing module APIs. The the tool does not provide much support for that. It's more like kind of a manual process. And how to do that you will hear more from Yaroslav. So using the tool we were able to modularize NDVs in uh, only 35 man hours. That was completely unfamiliar code first. So that, that was kind of a uh, kind of a good result. You can see the structure that we achieved. So it's kind of a mixture between the idealized uh, vertical division and, and the horizontal division. So we arrived at uh, explicit and pluggable feature models, which means you can take features in and out from the system without changing a single line of code by just loading or unloading the modules. And then the core modules underneath, they can actually be flexibly re reused right now with, in other applications without taking without the need for taking the features together with the core modules, because the core modules do not depend on the feature modules. Yes, so that basically concludes the architecture, arch architectures part. So definitely transitioning from uh, horizontal to vertical is possible. It can, it can be done, and in a reasonable amount of time. Then in order to tell about uh, how you can do it, how you can guide the process, we, I will mention some principles. So what I would like to 
promote, uh, or uh, what I would like to sell you in this talk is that the separation of concern is, is on the only principle you will ever need. I will try to show you why. Um, so what, uh, what is separation of concerns? What's, uh, that was uh, the term uh, is traditional, was coined by Dijkstra in 74. That is to study an aspect of a subject matter in isolation. That's a little bit uh, kind of difficult to grasp. But uh, so what are, the, what are those concerns? Concerns in your program could be your implementation of your use cases or your features, could be your persistence. That's one kind of concern. Could be security. That's also a kind of a good example of concerns, caching, and some others. So the notion of concerns and this kind of a point of view that there is some more to software than just classes and methods was later refined by the Aspect J guys. Uh, you probably know about that, aspect-oriented programming. Uh, there was also the Hyper J guys that uh, was also a little bit similar to aspect orientation, but yeah, it had some twist on it. So, so the, basically those two approaches, Aspect J and Harper J, they emphasize that there are multiple so-called dimensions or types of concern. So for example, if I have uh, one concern that is save my document, uh, then load my document, and then another concern that is, is maybe persistence, then kind of the, the user feature, the user concerns that, that carry out some task for a user are one dimension, and then the persistence is kind of an orthogonal dimension to that. Um, so what, what happens often with concerns is that they cross-cut. You probably heard about that. Uh, the, the particular two facets of cross-cutting is scattering and tangling. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So uh, when you modularize, basically, when you use the, the, the separation of concerns uh, principle, basically it boils down to reducing scattering and tangling of features. So what is scattering? Scattering is, uh, happens when a concern is implemented by several modules, so when, uh, when it's delocalized over those modules. So in order to, pre in order to reduce that, you, you need to ensure that your, your concerns will be localized. This, of course, reduces the scope of change because there will be only one place that we will have to change. And then uh, also reduces the, a thing called delocalization, which is a software comprehension phenomenon. Uh, so basically there was a paper that said if you have to change stuff in multiple places, it gets more difficult to understand. Um, so um, there's also the, the second thing, which is tangling. Uh, and tangling occurs where multiple concerns overlap or use the same piece of code. So basically, you don't want that because when you change the piece of, you, Let's imagine you want to, you, your intent is to modify one of the concerns, and you end up modifying code in, that is shared between this concern of interest and some other concerns. So what may happen is actually that you may break another concern that you are overlapping with in the process, and you don't want that. So it's best if you keep the, your concerns separate. Yeah, separation of concerns, exactly. Um, this, uh, this also reduces the, the so-called interleaving. That's another software comprehension phenomenon, by the way, that says that if you have several concerns that overlap with one another, then the code just gets more difficult to understand. That's kind of, uh, kind of intuitive. So I, also, I like to include real-world metaphors, and uh, I often use that to explain stuff that I'm doing in software to my girlfriend and to my friends that are not that fond of software. So, in order to grasp better what a concern is, we, we can look at a book. This book you probably know is Lord of the Rings. It, you could say it consists of three modules. Uh, <laughs> am I pushing it? <laughs> yes, so I know, uh, now I know that why my friends don't want to talk about software with me. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, so, um, so basically the book consists of three, uh, three modules. So there are three parts. The book is decomposed according to the, dim the dimension of time. So uh, first part of the book is uh, first period of, the time, of time and so on and so on. So that's the kind of the, the design of the book, you could say, the structure. But there is some more to it. If you look at the concerns of the book, there are several concerns. There are even several dimensions of concerns. So several concerns are like Mary Pippin, Sam, Frodo. So there's some characters, the characters dimension of concern. There's also some locations or some themes like Moria. That's another dimension of concern. So, and as you can really see graphically on, the, on this brilliant picture that I found on the internet, it's really, 
the concerns really tend to kind of tangle with, with each other and tend, tend to be scattered over different parts of the book. So that's that, this metaphor I really like. Okay, so uh, we kind of uh, got the grasp on uh, what those concerns are, what tangling is, what scattering is. Kind of that's a little bit maybe foreign to you. Uh, so uh, I, I thought it w would be a good idea to kind of help you to map this separation of concerns thing to some other principles that you may, may already know. So we said that there is two phase, phases of uh, separation of concerns, scattering and tangling. So if you look at scattering that deals with localizing stuff, putting in them in one place, uh, you may know uh, a principle con called information hiding that basically says you should not reveal too much. You should, uh, each model ha should have a secret that, uh, that should be guided, so the secret should not uh, leak out. Uh, then uh, there is uh, another principle called uh, low coupling. That's also basically if you, if you put stuff in one place, then obviously you, you reduce coupling, <coughs> so that's good. There's also the dry principle, meaning do not repeat yourself. Um, and that's also kind of if you have thing in one place, then it will not be, you will not have, yeah, that's basically what it, what it means. Having stuff in one place prevents you from having uh, clones of this uh, thing in some other places. So if we look on the tangling side right now, there's a principle called single responsibility. Basically, if what you have in your model is not tangled, so it serves only one, one purpose, then it has single responsibility. So that fits very well. Then that, that's very similar to the, the, to the principle of high cohesion. So cohesion means serving a single purpose. That, that's almost, almost the same as single responsibility. There's also another principle called common closure that says um, things that you group together in a module should always change together. So if you have the same concern or single purpose of the things that you group together, then they will always change together. So just as the last thing, I will um, I want to tell a little bit about uh, measuring this, these things because it's, it's all nice that, uh, that we have those principles and it's, it's all fine. But sometimes, you know, there's this famous saying that you cannot control what you cannot measure. Uh, so uh, in order to be able to understand in what state my, my program is, so how much effort would it take to modularize it, or when you are done modularizing to actually evaluate, uh, evaluate the results and maybe even uh, present some fancy pie charts or some fancy plots to the management, then, then you need to measure these things. So there are basically three options uh, that I can see. Uh, the first option is to do the concern location. So use some kind of a mechanism, uh, either static or dynamic or something else, to, to find where the concerns that you are interested in are in the code, and then use some of the concern-oriented metrics. There are some. You can use that. Uh, there's a paper that uh, reports uh, about this uh, being done at Motorola. I'm not sure if they are doing that uh, still, but uh, they tried that at some point and the paper kind of, the conclusion was kind of optimistic. So it's definitely possible also at companies, not only at universities. Um, there is uh, another option is to go f with static analysis and the, the metrics of cohesion and coupling. That's kind of, there's a lot of tool, tools out there that can do that for you. So you can also use that to get an approximation of the uh, uh, scattering and tangling. But there are some, some, kind of, some kind of corner cases. Like for example, consider the tension between the coupling, between coupling and code clones. Uh, if you have a class A that depends on class B for something, maybe calls a method, there is some kind of dependency. There's, you could say there's some kind of coupling between the classes. What you could actually do to remove this coupling is to say, okay, I take this method from here, copy it, put it in this class, I have no more dependency, but it, it's probably not really what you, what, you, what you want. There's also this case of the uncohesive Java util package. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, lot of stuff in, in Java util. It's not really cohesive if you, if you use the co cohesion metrics on it, but this kind of packages, they occur in, in real life. So real life is definitely not ideal. Uh, okay, and the, the the last, the last thing, the last way of measuring that you can actually uh, do some repository mining to, to check 
how the classes change together in your program. So if you plot that on the a dot for each class on the on the axis of time, you will see <laughs> if the classes that are that you have put into modules actually evolve together. Because if they they don't, then then you can uh, then then you have a problem. Okay, just to sum up and transition to to Yaroslav. What like the key points is uh, that I wanted to to tell you about is that module system is not is a tool. It's not a goal in itself. So, its module system is there to help you, but it will not not do the job for you. It's it's you that has to design the the modules. So there's no silver bullet modularization. It's very relative. Um, it's possible to restructure horizontal to vertical. And I was trying to convince you that separation of concerns is a root of all principles, and that you, that's the only one that you really have to remember, and the rest you can just go top down and, and kind of tr figure out as you go. Okay. okay. So these are the references. You can uh, read them later on on the web <laughs> when they sit. So yeah, then you can, there are some some interesting readings here. Yes. Thank okay. You. So let's put the Andre's talk into different context. I really like it. Uh, yesterday when we practiced, I was amazed uh, about the content of his part. But uh, what I'd like to talk and concentrate on is API design. Because when you have modules, you need uh, interfaces so the modules can communicate. And um, when you start designing APIs, well, as an initial architect of NetBeans platform, I spent a few years designing APIs. And you may realize that the rules to design APIs is, are slightly different than uh, the traditional rules that you use during software development. And I managed to collect at least 20 different paradoxes, something that slightly does not match our day-to-day -day expectation, unless you have uh, good enough knowledge of API design. And I will try to go through some of these paradoxes and put them into context of modularity. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> no, that's too much. Ah, okay. <laughs> no. Okay. I think. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Oh. Now it should be fine. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so the first thing to say is that all the recommendation, all the references that Andre uh, presented, talk about the change to minimize the change. Whenever you have new feature request, uh, you should be able to implement it easily without changing things on a, so many places if you have good enough modularization. But this is not what you can do with APIs. You cannot change APIs because if you publish API, it's like a star. You never know who is observing it, who is using the API. So you just cannot delete a method somewhere in your API and, um, because you cannot know all the places, all the users, and <clears throat> you cannot uh, fix all the usages. So basically, the, we still need to deal with change when designing APIs because we want to improve the APIs. But it's not like when you change something, you need to go somewhere uh, into all the usages and, and modify them. That's just not possible. Andrzej said that uh, the initial development of, uh, well, is about 10 to 15 percent of every project, and I can confirm that. Uh, basically, designing APIs is most of the time just a sustaining. When you are creating the first version, that's sort of innovative process. You can feel like an artist. But then, when you are about to release new and new version of an API, you need to care about the previous usages of the API, you just cannot completely change it. And that feels like a sustaining, which implies that basically you have only one try to do the API right. <clears throat> of course, we should anticipate what will happen in the future, because it, it's completely clear that however you try to design your API at the beginning, you will do something wrong, that the requirements will change, evolve, and you will need to update the API. So um, for that, I like to separate the APIs and SPIs, client APIs that people call in, and uh, service provider APIs that 
people implement. Because if you tell someone uh, to implement an interface, you cannot in a subsequent version add their new methods. So basically it's like a fixed point. It uh, cannot be modified if it's a server, uh, service provider API. If it's client provider API, then quite opposite. Every release, your users will be more and more happy if you add new methods uh, into your API because they will have more to call. And basically you are not breaking anyone by doing, uh, um, by adding something into an API that cannot be implemented by anyone else. You can just please newcomers. <coughs> and that uh, leads me to the topic of backward compatibility. So I know that backward compatibility, um, that there is source backward compatibility, binary backward compatibility, and f functional compatibility. The source means that whatever used to compile against previous version of your API should still compile. This is slightly hard to achieve in uh, Java because um, we have wildcard imports. So basically whenever you add something new into an API, um, someone's code can break because uh, the compiler will, uh, will not be able to identify which type uh, the code wants to import. So uh, the most important compatibility or the basic compatibility in Java is binary compatibility, which basically means if I compiled against previous version of your library, uh, I want to run in with that version and also with subsequent versions without recompiling. So it's just about linking on a class, uh, on a class level. Um, and <coughs> so, um, basically the paradox six from my book describes uh, some um, differences between source compatibility and binary compatibility. Because um, the format of uh, Java bytecode is very close to the structure of the Java language, but there are differences. And sometimes these differences uh, make a huge difference. <clears throat> uh, and then of course at the end functional compatibility is the Im most important one because you not only want to link with some new version of the API, but it should also work correctly. And achieving that is slightly hard. You probably need to write a lot of tests to guarantee that you keep the same functionality uh, of the while <coughs> producing new versions. Um, I, I tried once to live without APIs. My website is powered by MediaWiki, which is uh, written in PHP. So I happened to uh, be a PHP developer, beginner. Um, and um, basically the way how you deal with uh, MediaWiki and probably with other PHP projects as well is you download the sources, you unpack them, and then you start to mangle and change them. Well, that's perfect thing. At least it feels there are no APIs, no boundaries. Enough. You can do everything. Well, yeah, so I did it. Uh, and then new version of MediaWiki was uh, released. And I could not upgrade. It, probably that's the reason why people don't upgrade running servers that much. Uh, because I could, of course, apply the same diffs uh, to the new version, but would they fit in? Probably not, because the um, MediaWiki developers did changes, possibly in the same classes as me, and my, my patches would no longer be valid. And also, similar story uh, that I heard uh, by my uh, colleague, uh, he had a uh, system that they, uh, for tracking uh, issue requests um, in, inside of a company, serv service tickets. Um, and uh, they had a lot of customers, and, but they didn't sell the system as is. Usually they also delivered a consultant with the, with the system. And the consultants just went into the source code of the system and changed everything, tweak it so it fits uh, the needs of a particular customer. Uh, and then they had problem because they could not upgrade to new version. Uh, the company produced new and better versions of uh, the software, but nobody was able to take the version and replace it uh, on the customer side. And as a result, uh, the customers that were seeking in um, 
upgrades usually switch to a competition because if the upgrade is as painful as switch to new system why why try upgrades so having api basically gives you even um loyal customers um <clears throat> it's surprising that usually when designers uh, or architects try to design a system they uh, concentrate on a relationships between classes um, and sort of logical design but the physical design how do you structure modules is at least as important as well maybe even more because it influences how you can deploy things it shows what should be the interfaces and the interfaces should be stable so during your development you should concentrate on providing good apis between the modules so really the physical separation matters a lot um, we have good example of how modularity helped us because um, and actually modularity in form of osgi because we <coughs> wanted to share code between netbeans and jdeveloper and uh, for that we basically started to support osgi inside of the netbeans platform and uh, meanwhile the jdeveloper team uh, rewrote their system to use osgi and by having the common ground we could basically start to share between those two systems so really modularity um, helps you a lot even in sharing and uh, improving your design <clears throat> what is essential when you want to share when you want to take something from one system and bring it to another is how heavyweight your module is um, and the weight of a module is usually described as the amount of outgoing dependencies and dependencies are there to basically describe the necessary environment for a module because modules don't live in a vacuum they they always need something your your java code needs jdk uh, your java ee code will need a web, um, an uh, application server and uh, with tons of modules you somehow need to specify this and this environment is usually specified by dependencies um, and uh, the more dependencies you have on other modules the harder is it, is it to take these modules and bring them into different environment um, I have example with Mylin. Mylin is uh, originally Eclipse technology and uh, we are now reusing it in uh, NetBeans and again this is possible because of modularity because of supporting OSGI um, and uh, whenever we want to take um, a module from uh, from uh, from Mylin for example Bugzilla connector it really helps that the Mylin team decided to separate the core implementation of the Bugzilla connector with UI, uh, from from its UI so there is one module for the core implementation and one module for the UI and because Eclipse is SWT based and we are swing based we don't want the UI we want the core functionality but if they made a mistake and put the UI and the um, core functionality into one module the outgoing dependencies would, would be really huge and the module would not be reusable at all so uh, that basically says that if you have a module it should probably be uh, targeted towards a single single goal you should not mix the concerts um, I've uh, read a really nice uh, book about modularity by written by Kirk and um, he basically argues that um, re reuse complicates use basically if you have a monolithic system then it's much easier to to code against it but if you want to do what we did with the Mylan or with the J developer guys something like take the functionality and bring it into different environment then it's much better to have finer granularity of the modules because then they are more reusable and Kirk argues that uh, these two um, forces goes against each other and cannot be solved and actually um, I wrote a paradox about that uh, where I'm trying to introduce a black box pattern that 
basically tries to do this. And the example that I use is in NetBeans we have a module that can talk to a browser. So from so code inside of the NetBeans ID can open up a web page in a browser. And and this module has a simple API show a show URL. Uh, and it has no implementation but it uh, declares in its dependencies that it needs an implementation. And then we have about four modules, one for Windows, one for Mac, one for Linux, one for Solaris, that basically implements the API, the service provider interface of that module, and hooks in. And the uh, container, the NetBeans runtime container, knows that as soon as someone wants to use the API, it needs to also enable one of these modules depending on which platform you are running on. But the user of the API doesn't see that at all. So basically everything remains uh, modul modular. You can still reuse individual modules there, you can play with it. But the user, unless the user is really interested in, does not need to care. Everything works okay. And that's basically possible uh, in OSGI 4.3 because of their capabilities. They support that as well. Wow. <clears throat> so um, I decided that for the purpose of this presentation I will try to explain uh, solid and apply solid rules to uh, APIs. So here is a description of uh, or, uh, with every solid rule I'm trying to match it what it could mean for designing APIs. So single responsibility principle usually talks about a class should have a single meaning. So I mentioned that it's better if um, a module has a single meaning uh, if, you, if you want to reuse it. Also, um, I've noticed that the modifiers that we use in Java, like public, protected, are, don't have single meaning. If you make a method public somewhere, what is this good for? You can call it, but someone else can also subclass the class and override the method. So it has double meaning. It's much better. And, and having clear meaning of things helps the communication between the API designer and the user. So basically, uh, we prefer in NetBeans to use public final, that's only callable method, protected abstract, that's the one that you have to implement, and protected final, that means if you subclass it, you can call it. And those combinations of modifiers have single, single meaning, and I think it, it's much better to use them when designing APIs. <clears throat> open close principle. So it says that class should be open for subclassing, but closed for modifications. Well, that's all sort of okay for the provider APIs. If someone is going to implement some interface, then of course you cannot change it, it's closed. You um, however, uh, following this principle for client APIs would be disastrous. We tried that once and as a result, uh, the, all over the code base we had to uh, put if instance of a subclass of this class, then do something differently. And that's uh, relatively bad. So um, um, I rather uh, use final classes for, for, um, for the client API, and I can then evolve, evolve them so they are not that closed. And I, uh, but because they are final, I cannot hurt anyone by um, uh, adding something into those classes. <clears throat> Lishkov substitution principle says that uh, if there is a subtype of your type, then uh, you can use it uh, instead of the supertype uh, in all places, which is not true f for AWT. Just try to put j uh, JFrame um, on the place of JButton. It won't work. In spite, frame extends component. The problem is that people uh, often use inheritance not to express the subtype principle, but uh, just to reuse code. And that's that you can do it if you are if you are not in API business. But in API business, it's a big no-no. 
it's much better to not expose deep hierarchies at all, especially if client API is final class and there basically, any, uh, there basically can't be deep hierarchy anyway. Uh, and uh, rather than uh, doing things uh, with uh, inheritance, it's much more safer to do things with, uh, with delegation. Uh, okay. Interface segregation principle. So you should, it says that you should call code against interfaces, not uh, implementation. And actually, yeah, in NetBeans platform, uh, as well in OSGI, the modular containers really support this. They encourage you to uh, create uh, an abstract interface. It doesn't have to be interface, it can be abstract class. Uh, and then uh, let other modules to register their implementation. And they provide, uh, the, the modular system provides you a way how to obtain all the all the implementation. So this goes very well with mod modularity and API design. Um, dependency inversion principle. Um, yeah, I, uh, once I got into uh, an argument with dependency injection fan uh, who claimed that NetBeans APIs are old, uh, are too old fashioned and they use a lot of singletons and singletons are bad. You cannot use singletons. Every, every dependency injection fan knows that. Well, actually, I, that made me think about the reasons uh, why we are using singletons and why they are not that bad. And I realized that we in NetBeans have some special form of inject, uh, singleton, which I call injectable singleton. And I described that in Paradox 14. And I think it works relatively well. So the lesson to learn is uh, don't trust uh, um, uh, claims unless you understand what they are based on. <clears throat> uh, and a few more paradoxes. How APIs look from a point of view of a user. So in paradox one, I define that all users are clueless, that they worship cluelessness. And I, I don't think there's anything bad on that because we ha always have something better to do than fully understand libraries that we are using occasionally. Um, and the API design should support that. You, the good API should be used even by unexperienced people. And yeah, that basically leads me to an evaluation of an API. So uh, API can be evaluated from three perspectives. Coolness, uh, time to market, and total cost of ownership. So, Coolness is good because if uh, some API is not cool, you won't notice it exists. Time to market is essential. It supports the cluelessness. You basically should be productive with the API immediately. And, but total cost of ownership is very important in long term because you are not about to create just the f application, but you are going to maintain it and you will upgrade your libraries. And you want the upgrade not to um, negatively influence functionality of your, um, of your uh, application. So basically, total cost of ownership is very important in the long term. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. So uh, <clears throat> one claim that I made, and I basically observe it with my link guys as well, uh, if you have code which has APIs, it's easy to maintain it than if you have a code without APIs. Because users of your API are programmers. They can program. They know how to write unit tests. So, uh, and they also know how to create patches. So if you have API and you are open to contributions, then you basically can ask or offload the work to users of your API. Whenever they want to improve something, you can ask them to do it. And that's exactly what uh, my link guys did with me. I needed to contribute patches. And they said, oh, no, no, we're not formatting. Yeah, no, no. And the next one. So, but, but it worked for them very well. And actually, we are trying to do the same thing in NetBeans as well. And the last thing to say is about beauty. Sometimes um, you may want to reject uh, a donation into your API because it's not beautiful. And I think it's a complete mistake. Uh, APIs should be practical, it sh they should be usable, but the beauty, unless it hurts 
time to market or cost of ownership is not important at all. And also I should mention that we should optimize for the end users of the API, not for the writer. If a writer of API says, oh, I'm, the, the code is so ugly, I just don't want to do it. I, I, don't want such, I don't want to maintain such ugly code. Then that's a completely wrong argument because we don't care about a single writer. We, call, we care about the usages of uh, the API. Okay, so it's time to finish. Uh, I should mention that uh, this is my book that I just finished. Um, but actually it's not available on Amazon yet. We are in a review process. Uh, but if you want, you can visit uh, this URL and uh, at least uh, browse uh, the online resources on my website if you are interested in. And in a week, the book should be available. So thank you. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, there was a slide uh, where you were, uh, with the results of your instruction the whole product with feature modules and four layers. Yes. There were no interdependencies between feature modules. No. Was that uh, incidental or intentional? And if it's intentional, how do you do that if the features are uh, tangled by themselves? And yeah, okay, so the question was about uh, the diagram that I showed as the result of the restructuring of NDVs and uh, that there was no dependencies between feature modules. Was that accidental or was that intended or, or how, and how was that achieved basically? Uh, so yes, there was indeed no dependencies and that was one of our goals. Uh, uh, because if there wa were some dependencies between features, then you basically features, you cannot take one feature out of the system without taking, dragging another one with it. But uh, what we also found out is that some features will tend to, de will be dependent on each other. Basically this happens when uh, there exists like, you could say semantic or semantic dependency between features like, uh, so at the level of requirements, if you say, Let's have a feature that is save document and create a new document, right? You cannot save the document. Uh, maybe that's not the best example. But there will be, there will be some features that, that will have to depend on each other. Maybe one, if one feature is part of another feature, so there's a, some kind of a, a composition between them, then, uh, then, then this kind of stuff will occur. Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to add that, for example, my, um, my case with uh, the browser, it also has features. So we have a browser for Linux, Mac, Windows, and um, they, are, uh, they, they are completely isolated, but still the API has a dependency, a reverse dependency on one of those implementations. So, so the, really there can be dependencies on, among the features. Yeah, okay, any more questions? Okay, so the question is uh, how we will rewrite NetBeans module system to coexist with Jigsaw. Um, well, it's easy. It will be done by the OSGI guys. Because NetBeans is in, uh, interoperates with OSGI, Jigsaw will interoperate with OSGI, so that will be solved by someone else. Well, so that's not going to be that easy. We probably will do something. But uh, overall, it should work. We, basic, we basically demonstrated that we can coexist with other module systems, OSGI, so we should be able to coexist with Jigsaw as well. Yeah. 